All right, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Martha because she's done so much that if I drag it out of her, we'll be here for mm -hmm. hours. So I'm going to cheat a little bit, okay? Since joining CBS News in October of 1977, Martha has had one of those wide-ranging careers. She's been a correspondent for the CBS Sunday Morning since December of 93, based in New York, but for the 12 years before that, she was in the trenches, literally. Martha has received seven Emmy Awards, and this might surprise you. She's also won, <laughs> she's also won five James Beard Foundation Awards for her food-related reporting. She's a serious foodie, and I can testify to that. She's narrated seven of the biography programs for the A&E Network, and since 1995, you know she's conducted the conversations with during the Spoleto Festival. We're going to claim you as a Charlestonian. That's all right. Okay. <laughs> um, you come, you're here several times a year. You have a house on Seabrook, so we're going to talk about your journey a little bit. So even though you're a Charlestonian, where were you born? Where did it all start? I was born in Traverse City, Michigan. If you know anything about Michigan, Michiganders hold up their hands because, you know, the map of Michigan is your hand, your left hand, and I was born right there. At the, that's Traverse City, and I lived nearby in Leelanau County on a lake called Lime Lake. The nearest town was nine miles away, which was Cedar. It was a, it had a blinking light. It didn't have a stoplight, and one crossroads and um, a couple of little grocery stores, a gas station, um, a pharmacy, a barber shop, and a place where they hung meat. Um, <laughs> you know, if you shot a deer, you'd hang it at Casbin's Locker, which was in an old bank building, a small old bank building, because it was a very small town. A real cultural mecca. Mm. Tell yeah, us about your parents. Um, my parents were transplants to northern Michigan. My father um, was a professional skier. He um, came from Europe. Um, he, he left Germany in 1933. Um, he was Jewish, and he left when Hitler came to power. Right after my father finished university, um, he realized that it was a good idea to get out. And he was invited to coach the Spanish Olympic ski team of 19 th that was supposed to compete in 1936. So he left Germany and went to Spain and lived in the area around Barcelona and in the, 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 the uh, Pyrenees and uh, worked with the ski team until the outbreak of the Spanish Civil War. And then he got involved largely because of a girlfriend um, not your ski, mother? Not my mother. No, my mother was far in the future at this point. Her name was Carmen, and she was an aristocrat and very rich, and her family were being persecuted by the Franco people, and um, he rescued her on the ski slope at one point, and um, she had dislocated her shoulder, and he put it back in and, and fell in love with her and so on and so forth, but um, his fam or her family was not thrilled with him, um, because a German Jew, as opposed a to a, 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 even if he was coaching an Olympic team, mm -hmm. he was still um, not what they had in mind for their aristocratic Catholic daughter. Um, but he was perfectly all right to ski her family and subsequent families over the Pyrenees into France to get them out um, because they were being persecuted. And so mm -hmm. for a number of months, he lived in a monastery, and the, mon and, the, and the abbot would make the connections, and then he would pretend these people were ski classes, and then he would sneak out and ski them over the Pyrenees into France and then sneak back. And eventually he had a price on his head, and he had to leave. And he was sponsored to come to this country <coughs> by a man who had a dude ranch in Wyoming named Andy Anderson, who had a dude ranch called the A-Bar-A, which I discovered accidentally um, that Janet has a connection with. Um, and, and so did a number of other friends of mine I, that I had no idea. But there's, the, it's sort of like, um, there's, it's like DNA brings us together and the DNA is the uh, A-Bar-A ranch. And anyway, he arrived and he went to the ranch and he, uh, he arrived um, in 1937 and bought a used car and with a friend of his drove out to the ranch and was supposed to lay out a ski area in this beautiful, beautiful Wyoming countryside at the ranch. 
and at the ranch there was a Life magazine photographer and my father and various other people and um, they uh, play cowboy. My father was a, a, a um, he became a um, clown in the Cheyenne Rodeo and you know we have pictures of him that the Life magazine photographer took of him in the barrel with the bull running after him and, and so here's this guy who comes from Bavaria, who was a German Jew, who's just um, had to get out of Spain, who's now living his, his cowboy fantasy in Wyoming. <laughs> and then he goes to Sun Valley, which is where all the um, European ski stars ended up if they left Europe. And um, he worked at Sun Valley until they created the 10th Mountain Division, which were the ski troops in World War II. And then he went off and was one of the 10th Mountain Division. Um, he never was allowed to go back to Europe to fight um, because they misunderstood what he was doing in Spain, skiing the people over the Pyrenees into France, and they thought he was a communist, but he wasn't. And so he ended up um, doing all kinds of sort of espionage work and uh, interrogation of war prisoners and that sort of thing. And after the war, people that he met in the army said, well, we need you to come up to northern Michigan and lay out a ski resort. We have the money, all these investors. We just need you to come out and lay it out. And he did, and he believed them. And of course, they didn't have the money. And so my mother quit her job. Um, he met my mother because in one summer, she, he was uh, hired to redesign the sports department at Marshall Fields in, in Chicago um, to have a ski department. And my mother was working her way through college at Marshall Fields in personnel and labor relations. And my father saw her in an elevator and said, I'm going to marry her, and pursued her for years. And she thought, who is this weird man? And she thought, maybe if I just say I'll go out with him and stand him up, he'll go away. Well, she did that. And so he came to her office and had a screaming tantrum and said, I will stop screaming if you agree to behave properly and civilly and go out with me like we had planned. And so their entire relationship was like that. Um, uh, it was, it, I mean, that's how they played life. And it was very colorful. And so I, as an only child growing up in northern Michigan, where they decided to stay after a while because they liked it, after my mother quit her job at Marshall Fields and so on and so forth, and my father got stranded up in northern Michigan <coughs> waiting for the investment to actually happen, which to this day, many, many, many years later, it still hasn't. Um, um, so they liked it up there, and he had left two countries, and this was home. And he, he found that northern Michigan was beautiful, and there were all kinds of other people who came after World War II, and... We lived on 40 acres, and we had woods and lake, and lived in an old house, and um, great big trees. And I, as a small child, um, had no playmates because I was an only child, and we lived a mile and a half from our nearest neighbor and nine miles from Cedar. And um, there were no children. And so my life was observation of larger worlds. I, my father taught at a, a, a private school called the Lelano Schools, um, and there were lots of interesting kids there. And I would go, I, I went there as a first grader and second grader, and would just run around the school after school and watch all the big kids mm -hmm. have theater you know, rehearsals and track meets and uh, rehearsals for this and competitions for that and so on. And it was like theater for a little kid because I had co the complete run of the place. Nobody paid any attention to me. I could just look at it like, um, um, like a movie almost. And at home, since there were no kids, I paid attention to my parents' adult world. And they had very interesting friends. And there was always interesting talk and there were interesting people to go see. And when I was home, I in, in, to keep myself busy, I would observe what was around me, birds, nests, and trees, and animals, and that sort of thing. And my father would give me his little typewriter, um, and I would, and his, you know, boxes of paper, and I would make little newspapers and write stories 
about all this stuff I experienced as a little kid observing an adult world that was very colorful if you compared to kid stuff. And um, I think from the time I was about six, all I ever wanted to do was write. And ultimately, that's what I do for a living. And I learned um, observation techniques because my parents encouraged that. They, we, they would take me into the woods and they, they would point out the wildflowers and they would point out the trails of animals and mm -hmm. they would point out the leaves and they would point out things that you see in the woods. And then I would be expected to um, comment on those things and remember those things. And so it all my pr vicarious life um, taught me to be, in a sense, an, a professional observer, which stood me in good stead forever. How about your schooling? Well, I started out going to school at Leelanau schools where my father taught. Beautiful campus right on Lake Michigan, where the Crystal River joined Lake Michigan. We had 13 kids between kindergarten and eighth grade, all in one room. In the fish house, which was on a bridge right at the, where the river joined the lake. Mm -hmm. And we had, Miss Vicky was our teacher, and she would throw us all in her car, all of uh, the entire school, and take us places. And we had a school naturalist, and they would take us into the woods and show us eagles nesting and things that happen in woods. And we would go down to the beach, and we would draw pictures of the um, freighters going by and the Great Lakes freighters and oil tankers and things, and then we would learn about those. and observe why they were high in the water or low in the water. Or, uh, um, and um, it was mainly faculty children. Uh, and then after school, as I said, I had the run of the place where I could observe all the big kids. And I knew who was dating whom, and I knew who had a crush on whom, and I knew all the gossip. And, you know, you just absorb all of it. And um, uh, then uh, they closed down the lower school. Mm -hmm. And I had to go to a public school. And so I went on the school bus from our house to Leland. And there was a consolidated school. And um, um, it was in a lovely little town that's um, a kind of a resort area and fishing village. And I remember the, the uh, again, nature was so powerful. Um, in the spring, um, Lake Michigan would freeze in the wintertime, and the first real sign of spring would be the icebreaker Mackinac coming. And it was like explosions. You could hear the, the, the icebreaker crashing through thick, thick lake ice. And when the icebreaker Mackinac would come and we'd hear it in our school, we would just all run out of school, run down to the breakwater, and watch the icebreaker come through and break up the ice so that the um, St. Lawrence Seaway and the, and the Great Lakes uh, um, uh, tanker traffic would begin again. And it was exciting. And then we had smelt runs um, where the smelt, these little teeny, uh, I don't know if, if people in the ocean areas may not know what smelt are like, but little, fish, little right? teeny fish and just thousands and thousands of them and we would all get out of school and dip the smelt and then we would the families would cook the smelt and we'd eat the smelt and so on and we'd get taken to um, people's farms for um, the maple sugar the maple syrup they would tap the trees and then there were certain farms where they would make them make the syrup in these sugar shacks and so on we go see that. And we had potato vacations in the spring and fall for kids who had to stay home on the farms and plant and harvest the potatoes. And a lot of these kids were from families where there were either multi-million dollar orchards or very poor family farms. And the farms, um, the kids would, one kid would go to school one week and another kid would stay home. And then they'd switch off um, in order to um, help it with the farm. And so all that that sort of hard scrabble farming and the way of nature and the land was part of everyday life in everything I understood. And you know, you'd go home on the school bus on the day that they would be tilling the fields and you'd smell the manure as they were planting. And you knew that that was 
spring. And I mean, there were all these things that related to the cycles of the land. And I don't think I've ever forgotten any of that stuff. And it, it affected everything that um, I understand about place. Was there a teacher or teachers that had a profound effect on you? In high school, I had one teacher that had a profound effect on me. Um, his name was Mr. Freusland. He was the my junior year honors English teacher. And he made a, he was very rigorous. He made us write constantly. And we had, he, we would be given very complex assignments. And you had to write an essay, a serious essay, every single week. And the discussions that we had were very topical. And, and it was, I was in high school um, at the time that civil rights was bubbling to the surface and the Vietnam War. I graduated from high school in 1965. And there was a lot of sort of volcanic, um, sort of subterranean volcanic eruption waiting to happen um, when I was in high school. And then when I got to college, it did erupt. And, um, but Mr. Freusland was the perfect person to get us ready for that. And it's interesting, he taught a number of people to be writers. Um, I don't know if any of you, do you listen to NPR at all? Do you know John Hockenberry? Yeah. John Hockenberry was several years behind me at East Grand Rapids High School. And John Hockenberry also had Mr. Freusland. And he also attributed his career to Mr. Freusland. Did Mr. Freusland ever know that? Mm -hmm. Good. Mm -hmm. Then you went to college. Mm -hmm. You went away. Mm -hmm. Where and why? I went um, to Wellesley College, um, and I, most of the people in my class in high school tended to go to University of Michigan or Michigan State or Midwestern schools. Um, some went East College. Um, I wanted to go to Wellesley because um, it struck me as being a place where I could learn a lot around other women. Um, it was demanding, but I liked the atmosphere. I wanted to go away because I uh, really wanted nothing whatsoever to do with um, the life of East Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, we had moved to Grand Rapids, East Grand Rapids after my father died when I was nine, and um, I uh, loathed and detested it. And I hated the clickiness, and I hated the the values and I hated, mm -hmm. it was a really, really, really good school and still is, but I didn't like the way of life. And I, I did not want to go to a state university as good as the University of Michigan is, uh, where I would be subjected to any of the people I went to high school with. Uh, I wanted to get as far away from that as possible. I wanted my world to be bigger. I did not want to go to a college where there were 40, 50, 60,000 kids, and you, everything about your life was owned and operated by the university. I just, I wanted to explore the unknown more. And Wellesley satisfied that need because it was um, a completely different world, rigorous academically. It was near Boston, and I could explore what it was like to be the citizen of a real city on my own um, without having college trappings holding me back or, or dictating the terms of my day-to-day -day existence. And, and I used Boston a lot in everything I did um, because it was um, a way to kind of uh, jump off the building and try my wings. What did you major in? Economics. Not English? No. Um, the first economics class I took was so exciting in that it taught me how to read the newspaper and very I had a really 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 cool teacher um, her name was Martha Rosen and she and her husband Richard worked at a consulting firm in, in, in um, Cambridge and they were just the coolest people and they did cool projects and I learned how to read the newspaper in my first economics class uh, macroeconomics and you learn about the money supply and you learn about all the kinds of things that ultimately affect politics and you think huh this is the real world yeah. and 
it's got applications in, in I'm never going to be a great economist, but there are pieces of this in everything. Mm -hmm. And um, the English department, um, I, it turned out I could do more creative writing as a non-English major than I could as an English major because I could, I could take whatever I wanted in the way of creative writing classes. Um, but if I had been an English major, you had to do, there was a distribution and you had to take very specific classes. Right. And I found a lot of the faculty in the English department very hidebound and kind of um, old-fashioned and dull. And <laughs> that's valid. That's, that's fair. And so I just thought maybe economics would be more exciting. What about after graduation? Um, like many people, I had no clue what I wanted to do. And it was, you know, it was almost a sickness not knowing what you want to do. Being upset and being anxious and thinking, when am I going to discover what it is I'm meant to do? And worrying that I never would discover what I was meant to do. Um, I wanted to write. Um, because even though I majored in economics, as I said, I'd, I knew I'd never be an economist. I wasn't that good, and I wasn't that mathematical. And um, I was sort of dabbling at the idea of going into museum curatorship. I loved decorative arts and, and American art, and I loved writing, and I thought about law school, and this, and I thought, what the hell, this is too much stuff, you know? What? You know, that's four or five different things that you could maybe do. And I went to work for a group of, of um, local magazines where I was selling advertising. And every time I would get a good client and everything lined up, they would take the client away and give it to the man who was on the, uh, the staff who was paid differently than I was. I guess I didn't understand that I was supposed to run around and do the legwork and he had the real income. I lasted three months there. And then I went to work in publishing. I went to work um, as a temporary help worker at Harvard University Press. And they put me to work running a department as temporary help. Um, and as temporary help, I, I cleared <coughs> maybe $50 a week. And they were getting a department head. And what I did was I was the liaison between order, all the order processing and all the North Cambridge women who did the order processing as they were transitioning to computer. And so I had to deal with the orders so that the women would understand how to process them and they would all get processed correctly and keep the women functioning and teach them and all of that stuff. And it um, was a terrible job. Um, number one, and number two, because I was temporary help, I made no money. Yeah. And, but it enabled me to go to something called the Book Builders of Boston School of Publishing, which was a night kind of um, collective of all sorts of people in all sorts of disciplines in publishing, teaching all these things at night to other people in publishing. And I was able to go on, uh, as part of Harvard University mm -hmm. Press and learn, all, take all these classes um, at Book Builders. And then I became, I went to MIT Press um, working as um, um, international sales manager, I was called, <coughs> which meant that I would ne help negotiate the contracts with foreign book buyers and sellers and so on. Then I would go back and I would type them and then I would fill all the orders. And what I really wanted to do was write jacket copy. I thought that would be really, really, it would be writing. But very quickly in publishing, you learn that if you're working in publishing, you write nothing. Um, writing jacket copy is not satisfying if you want to be a writer. And at the time I was at, at um, MIT Press, um, this was when we were bombing Cambodia. This was when there were all kinds of, of protests against Vietnam. It was the first Earth Day. Um, all kinds of major things were happening in society. and. Um, I went to a, 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 a huge symposium at Kresge Auditorium at MIT on the coverage of controversial events, um, hoping that I could come to some kind of resolution in my own mind about how to think through what was happening socially in, in, in politics and 
government and the war and civil rights and so on, all of it was all happening at once. And you, you read the paper and you talk to your friends and everybody has a kind of a viewpoint. And you want to establish your own viewpoint. You want to know what you believe is true. And so I went to this symposium on the coverage of controversial events thinking it would clarify something. If, if these are people covering the events, maybe they have some insights. And at that point, I didn't even know that a newspaper would cover an event like a riot or a demonstration differently from a weekly magazine or a television network or um, a monthly magazine like The Atlantic. And there were people here at this symposium from each different type of news organization. <coughs> and someone from, was the editor of the Boston Globe, it, it, it was um, the editor of, or the, um, Mike Wallace from <coughs> the CBS, it was before 60 Minutes existed. Um, uh, it was somebody with the FCC, it was somebody with the Atlantic, and it was uh, Fred Friendly from CBS as well. Um, and just every kind of news organization that was sort of in the arena was represented. And it was like I was struck by lightning. I knew that night exactly what I had to do for a living. I had to be a journalist. Um, I had been accepted at law school but couldn't go um, because I couldn't deal with advocacy. I couldn't be the person that might be badly used by someone who didn't deserve mm -hmm. my skills and I couldn't be the person who maybe failed someone who deserved better. Uh, and I was terrified of advocacy. And I thought, that's not the place in the arena that I belong. Um, I was, even though there's law is really much broader than that at that point, I didn't really understand it in anything but black and white terms. But it's as if that night at, at MIT, suddenly I knew that being a journalist, a journalist, that was the place on the fence I was meant to be. That if I was out witnessing events, processing what those events entailed and what they meant, and then communicating them back to somebody, that that was the best I could do in terms of understanding what was true and what I, truly, what I really thought. And so I quit my job at MIT Press and went back to Michigan um, to live with my mother and hopefully earn enough money to go to graduate school in journalism. And I was supposedly going to work for an ad agency that my uncle was a partner in. They had a book account. Um, they were representing Zondervan, which is a religious publisher, and at that point was not part of a bigger company. It was independent in Grand Rapids, and they needed somebody who had some publishing experience to be a kind of a liaison between the ad agency and, and Zondervan. And by the time I got there to take that job, um, they had lost the account. And so there I was, unemployed, and so I worked seven days a week as a waitress and worked about seven days a week as well um, for a, a group of weekly newspapers. Um, and I was the, quote, editor of the Jenison Almanac. There were a group of Almanac newspapers in western Michigan owned by a woman named Ann Fromm. And she also had uh, the Chamber of Commerce monthly magazine and a quarterly that was the magazine for a fancy private club in Grand Rapids. I ended up editor of the Chamber of Commerce magazine and I was the editor of the Peninsula Club magazine and I was the editor of the Jenison Almanac, which meant that I did things like collect the building permits and see what was going on with the police blotter in Jenison, which was a uh, suburb of Grand Rapids, which was actually going up before my very eyes. It was one big building permit. and. Um, and I was uh, writing all the articles in the Chamber of Commerce magazine, and I was writing all the articles, just writing feature stories, having a wonderful time, running around writing anything I wanted. And it was often kind of a conflict because 
as a waitress, I was working at a restaurant where the Chamber of Commerce would sometimes have lunch meetings. And the head of the Chamber of Commerce would um, not quite know what to do about his Wellesley educated editor of the weekly of the monthly magazine who was waiting on their table. And um, he, he there was it was all kind of confusing as to, you know, how to deal with this class system. And uh, it was great training. And then while I was doing that, um, grossing $75 a week with no expenses paid and um, were really surviving on the waitress money, I got my fingers smashed in the glass doors that they use. That in Michigan, you have to cover up the plates in restaurants with glass doors. And so I got my finger caught and managed to injure it. And they put a big bandage on it, and it fell in somebody's salad, so they made me stay home. And while I was at home, I was going through the one ads and things, and I was looking for auctions to go to because I loved auctions. And I saw an ad in the newspaper for a radio newsman. And I thought, huh? Radio newsman, okay. I might like that. So. Um, I had a bronchial condition much like the one I have now. <clears throat> and I had the injured finger, and I called them up and I said, I would like to apply for the, ra the <coughs> radio newsman <laughs> job. And they were, um, they, you know, sort of were open-minded. Mm -hmm. And they said, okay. So after I got to the point where I wasn't coughing, I went in, had never been in a radio station in my life. and. Um, they said, well, here's a lot of wire copy. You know, you, at that point, they had teletype machines where wire copy spewed out and uh, from rolls of paper. And you had news stories that would come out and uh, from the AP and UPI and so on and so forth. And they said, here's a pile of news stories. And we'd like you to kind of go through these and sort of synthesize them and make a little news report, um, five minutes. And, you know, you distill these down to each one should be about 30 seconds long. And here's a stopwatch. And I thought, oh, I could do that. So I wrote out these little newscasts. And they said, here's the microphone. And the engineer is through that glass. And he'll tell you when to start. And you wait till the clock goes to 12. And you, that's how you time it. And then um, this is the microphone and the little red needle when it goes into the red um, You're too loud and try to keep it kind of in the middle. That was the extent of your training That was my audition right. and they hired me and I'm absolutely positive It was because they I was cheaper than there were all these longtime professional males from all over Western Michigan and various places who had applied for the job. But I already lived there, and I could be hired cheaply. And um, I made $125 a week. And they said, well, we can pay you some overtime up to about 60 hours. But um, after that, we're not paying you for overtime. And I was part of half of the news department. Um, the other half worked from 5 in the morning till noon, and I worked from 11 o'clock in the morning until uh, whenever at night. And um, I just sort of, I had one day of training, and then I taught myself, largely because um, I saw what I did wrong. I was up against a 40-man AM FM TV operation called WOOD TV, which was owned by Time Life. And they spent tons of money. And they had really, really good news. And they had people who went on to bigger and better mm -hmm. things. <coughs> and I just um, thought, copied what was good and tried to establish myself. And there was a wonderful trick you could do. Um, the AP would give you name and station credit when you call in stories. And so I got so that my specialty was local government coverage. I could, in an afternoon, work all the local government buildings, the police department, the courts, um, the, the county offices, the city offices, and sort of become an expert at what was going on. And then I would go back, and my afternoon newscast was on at 5 o'clock. And I would always, stories that I knew were unique to me, that I was breaking, um, good stories, I would wait to call it into AP. Um, till it was too late for my competitors to call up and check because the city officers, when all the city offices were closed at five. 
And so they would see my stories coming across the wires um, at five o'clock. And they didn't automatically listen to me at the country western radio station um, where we had bus trips to Nashville and all the disc jockeys, jockeys were called cousin somebody. But I had to make them pay attention. And so they would see my name coming across on these stories that turned out to be stories they had to cover and they couldn't check because it was too late. And so pretty soon they paid attention to my newscasts. And I thought, this, I'm going to learn how to do this. And I tried to learn how to be a broadcaster by doing karaoke newscasts. We were a CBS affiliate. <coughs> and CBS has always had um, very substantial radio newscasts. We had the World um, the Tonight, which was the evening one, which is a 15 minute newscast with people like Douglas Edwards and, and <coughs> major names and you know Eric Severide anchoring them and so on, important people. And then they would have all the different stories and I would have to split up those newscasts and build a, uh, an FM newscast myself and I thought well this is interesting so I'll I transcribed those newscasts and I would listen to the way they would Eric Severide or Douglas Edwards or um, you know the, all the major CBS voices would do things and when I was finished doing what I had to do, I'd take the recorded newscast and I would take the transcript and I would turn up the recorded newscast and I would read my transcripts so that I was listening to the pacing of how the greats were doing their broadcasts. And that taught me how to be a broadcaster because I didn't have anybody to learn from. I was just sort of latching on to things that I thought would teach me something and improvising. I want you to fast forward a little bit. You went to Network, 1977. Mm -hmm. How did that happen? I went from W, um, I went from the radio sta station WJEF to WZZM, the ABC affiliate in Grand Rapids, to WTVJ, the CBS affiliate in Miami, and then to WMAQ, the NBC-owned station in Chicago. And you're doing television news. Yeah, you know, I got into television f after the radio station in Grand Rapids, mm -hmm. and um, um, because they had to pay attention to what I was doing, and they wanted that coverage, and that had to start learning TV the same way by shooting all my own film film in those days. Yeah. And uh, so I was in Chicago and various people had been keeping an eye on stuff. They had seen me in different markets. One, the director at WMAQ um, had a mother in a home in Fort Lauderdale. Mm -hmm. And so he saw me in Miami. And I had sent a tape to WMAQ. And they kind of put two and two together. And then somebody else saw me on TV in, in um, Chicago. and. Um, eventually they, you know, the people watching TV at CBS um, in the Chicago Bureau of CBS um, decided that I was network material. And uh, so they um, suggested my name in New York mm -hmm. and um, they contacted me and said, uh, we'd like to um, have a talk with you. And so they hired me. And um, really, I mean, once you get past a certain point, you could try to find your way. But when you're on television, people see you on television. Mm -hmm. And that's the best way to get your next job. People see you on television. Sometimes it's because of the tapes you sent out. But I ended up going um, to better stations than any of the places I sent tapes um, or really thought I wanted to go. And that's what CBS approached me. And so I went to work with them, at, um, and they said, well, I'm sorry we don't have an opening in the Chicago Bureau. And at that point, I was thinking Chicago Bureau, Duluth in January, um, how can I be colder? Um, and they said, well, I'm really sorry. Um, we want you in the Atlanta Bureau. And I just, I could hardly contain my glee. I thought, I'm going to be warm. I'm not going to be freezing cold. So I got transferred to Atlanta. And we had um, 14 states in all of Latin America, which is, was a wonderful way to learn. Because um, 
we just covered everything. And at that point, there was a lot of really original coverage um, where you'd spend three months on a story. And it was just a terrific way to learn. Very rapidly, you know, you, you, your life's dream is to be a network correspondent, and you get to be that at 29. And you think, well, okay, now what? Um, where do I go from here? And yes, you know, you learn everything around you, and you, you do everything you can to f make your way onto the, the stories that are going to be tough and demanding and thorough and interesting and um, provide you an education <coughs> as well as mm -hmm. um, a way of being on the air. But very rapidly it occurred to me that the way, th the route that I wanted was to go overseas because the people at CBS that I admired most were the people who had been foreign correspondents. And you went to London yeah. within like two or three years. Yeah, in 1980. And you covered some pretty heavy stuff. Pick one thing from that period that really affected you. The hunger strikes in Northern Ireland. Mm. That was months and months and months and getting to know the families of the hunger strikers and one by one they would die and being with their families and so on and you know, week after week after week, and uh, it was really emotionally shattering. And you, you couldn't help but be sucked into the drama of it as well, and, and the history of it, because um, I went believing that the Irish Catholics were all terrorists, and very rapidly I came to another way of thinking because I began learning the history of Northern Ireland and why the troubles are what they are and um, radically altered my viewpoint of what the struggle was all about and um, um, learned a tremendous amount. From there, you went to South <coughs> Africa. No, I went to, um, um, to Dallas. Oh, I didn't, that's not in your official bio. Well, that's Was that a little blip? Oh, I was sent to Dallas from London for three years. Oh. And um, I uh, went to South Africa to get out of Dallas. Um, <laughs> um, I really... And this is 1984, 85? 80, I went to South Africa in 87. 87. I went to Dallas in 84. And, you know, I covered interesting things. I was in Latin America a lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, like the... I think you went out with some DEA agents, didn't you, at some point? That was when I was back in London. Okay. In 89. <coughs> we spent several weeks in Bolivia with the DEA. Um, Drug Enforcement Agency. Um, liberating um, coca plants and bar, you know, sort of big bags of semi-processed uh, cocaine and so on and so forth and at that point um, that was in about 1989 or 90 um, after South Africa. Um, well, I have to interject on just a personal note <coughs> I was in South Afri Southern Africa Southern Africa at the same time from 87 basically to 90 and the way I met Martha was through a mutual friend who unfortunately is no longer with us but we discovered over a good bottle of wine that the three of us were within a, what, 500 mile radius yeah. of each other at the same time. And of course we didn't know each other, but yeah. we were able to figure that out once we met many years later. Yeah. Now, uh, you were there during apartheid, Mandela yeah. was still in jail. Yeah. So you saw some of the worst of the treatment of black South Africans. Oh yeah, um, uh, it was, there still were past laws. Um, people had to have passes to come into certain, black people had to have passes to come into certain parts of the cities in order to work. Or um, they, were, they were still removing people and dumping them out in the middle of nowhere um, and destroying their homes. The homelands. Um, in the, the home. South Africa had and still has these sort of islands of black in the middle, just sort of scattered about in the countryside. And basically they were artificially created homelands, yeah. tribal homelands, where um, the South African government would set up a kind of a black potentate um, and, you know, sort of allow for corruption and so on and so forth and relocate all these people who had prior to that lived in, in cities like Johannesburg and, and townships in Johannesburg and, and, and Cape Town and Durban and so on, and dump them in these homelands where um, there was no work. 
And so they would have to get permission to come back um, with their passes to work in hostels or mines. And, <coughs> um, and then these homelands would tend to be women and old men and, and children uh, because the men of working age had to go elsewhere um, to find some way to make a living and take the money home. And the South African government was able to strictly control who went where and how many people went where um, with these passes um, that enabled people to leave the homelands. And um, it was a very strange artificial situation. And um, it was very violent in the, um, there were all kinds of, it was the era of necklacing where um, people would, um, there were these kind of warlords within townships who would fight against the government. But anybody they considered a traitor, they would put a tire around their neck, fill it with gasoline and set it alight and burn these people to death. And so it was brutal at the same time there were people that you did admire who were fighting to end apartheid. It was, uh, there was a lot of violence. Mm -hmm. there, um, the government would come in and they would, um, they would uh, tear gas people. They would um, plow them down with, with um, armored vehicles and jail them. And you could be jailed uh, for an indeterminate period of time without any charges just because it was part of the state of emergency. And um, there was an uncertainty and a danger and a, um, a, a kind of um, um, constant kind of undercurrent of violence mm -hmm. throughout South Africa. And yet white South Africans could manage to live almost completely separate from all of that. But they still had the uneasiness and the, the, the discomfort and the fear and the and the worry about it. And, um, but journalists were in and out of the townships all the time, seeing the riots and seeing the aftermath where the, the government would come in and, and, and attack the people who were attempting to, to protest and that sort of thing. And there was a real discomfort. A lot of white South Africans were uncomfortable with journalists because they blamed the journalists for the conditions in the country. And They'd, sanctions. Yeah, and sanctions. <coughs> but it, it was, I will look back at my life and my career. <coughs> Excuse me. South Africa will be the, the most important part of it. Wow. You had another interesting experience in that you were one of the <coughs> first reporters to be embedded with a military unit. You want to talk a little bit about that? Well, I had covered a lot of wars before being embedded. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was in Beirut for no, um 83 and 84 extensively and you know I'd been in Northern Ireland and I'd been in El Salvador and so on <clears throat> but in the Gulf War in 1991 they had what the, they didn't call it being embedded at that point they referred to it as military pools and you would be sent out with in my case the first armored division and so I spent the war out in, in the desert with the first armored division and um, um, it wasn't, um, being a woman wasn't so much the issue, <coughs> but there were a lot of people. At that point, the generals and the colonels were all people who had been in Vietnam, and they blamed the news media for losing the Vietnam War. And so they hated us. Yeah. They hated having anything to do with us. But we were required to be there, and so they would, th grudgingly take us on but try to thwart us at every turn and we and you know we they said well you can't go out because you don't have your own vehicle we went back and got our own vehicle um, you can't do this unless you have that okay we had our own tents we had our um, and they would assign people to us as handlers and so on um, so the real problem wasn't being a woman it really um, even though being a woman completely surrounded by um, males who were operating tanks um, required, you know, sort of changing clothes in my sleeping bag um, so that, you know, because you couldn't change in front of mm -hmm. the men. And, uh, but it was, um, uh, that wasn't nearly the most dangerous area I was. I mean, <coughs> the unofficial wars were much more dangerous. Do you think that women journalists cover war differently from men? I do. I do. I think that I won't say better or worse, just differently. Um, I think women have, 
And not always the case. I mean, you think of Ernie Pyle in World War II, mm -hmm. who had a sense of people. Um, but I think, in general, women tend to look at the, the humanity of the people involved in different ways than men. Um, it, it's, it, and as I say, it's different. It's not better or worse. Um, you will think of the lives, both of the soldiers and the people who are on the receiving end of a war. Um, you're more sensitive to those things, I think. And I think with a lot of men, not all, but certainly many, um, it's, oh, we're going to go play soldier. Oh, we're going to go, um, you know, see all these vehicles that we can ride on, and mm -hmm. um, this is a big adventure. And women don't see it in the same way as a big adventure. They see the subject matter, and they, say they, they see young boys who are away from home for the first time. Mm -hmm. They see people who, um, if they're going to be on TV, they say, put me on TV so my mom can see me. Um, they, they see families who have um, uh, lost everything because their homes have been bombed or strafed or whatever. Um, and I think there is a difference with that. So in 93, you came back and started with CBS Sunday Morning. And if you haven't seen it, you're crazy. You need to turn it on every Sunday morning at 9 o'clock on your CBS station. And you have covered everything. Mm -hmm. I looked at the list of the interviews. Norman Mailer, Joan Baez, the cast of Downton Abbey. You do stories on some of the most interesting things and some of the most what you would th think initially trivial things. But you become an expert in it. It's fun. I mean, that's the, you go out there and <coughs> my approach to my job is that every single, I mean, that you go out and you're, you're away from home and you're out covering stuff and you're working 15 hour days. But every single day is a day of my life. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's not my work and then I come home and have my life. Each day I'm out doing a story, shooting it, going, coming, being with the people I work with and so on, is a day of my life. And I owe it to the people who, you're cover to I'm, who I'm covering, and I owe it to the audience to learn as much as I can about that story and to absorb as much as I can mm -hmm. so that I'm doing justice to what I'm covering and I'm, I'm communicating it as well as I know how to the audience. And I'm in the middle. I'm the go-between. I'm almost like a public servant. Um, and um, I have to listen to the story, in a sense. As I'm covering it, I have to pay attention to the tone of the story so that I know how to tell the story. Because every story you tell a little differently. Um, you, in a sense, get in character. You get in the character of the story so that you know what language to use and how to phrase things and, um, and whether to be lyrical or whether to be choppy or, or you know, just how to write it mm -hmm. so that you figure out how best to tell that story um, because every story has dictates its own terms. And I want to give everything I can to it and I want to take everything I can from it because it's a day in my life. And I want to have that, you know, you look back on those experiences and that's what you carry with you. Whether it's um, going out to California and working on a story about drones, which I did in January, mm -hmm. or the last story I had on was about a crazy guy in Wilmington, Delaware, and his unbelievable birdhouses. Yes. You know, yes. you know that it's just from the sublime to the ridiculous. Mm -hmm. <coughs> but they're all interesting. And they're all days in your life. Exactly.